the commentary of Rashi and myself on Isaiah 52 verses 13 through 15 and all of Isaiah 53 describing God's righteous servant the Moshiach according to my commentary which includes commentary on the commentary of Rashi. Rashi's commentary is that the man being described is Israel, which means it's not the Moshiach of chapter 11, and which also means we have no description of him. 52.13 Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and he shall be very high. Rashi. This is Midrash form. He takes parts of verses and comments on the parts. And he'll, he doesn't necessarily take all the verse, but the parts he wants to comment on. And this is how he starts. Behold, my servant shall prosper. Behold, this is Rashi now. Behold, at the end of days, my servant Jacob, i.e., the righteous among him shall prosper. Keith. And I'm using the JPS. Uh, this is from Shabbat.org. Those are, they have the rendition that doesn't include the quotes between 13 and 15 and the quotes between verse 1 and 6 of uh, 53. The multiple quote verses. This is from the JPS. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. My commentary on that is, my servant is now the Gentile, and not the exiles, who becomes my righteous servant. In Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, 10. When he makes himself an offering for guilt in the covenant with God. From a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon, to the crown of God's righteous servant who rises to great heights. This is uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. Chapter 11 begins with, Spirit of God alights upon the twig of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse, where the ancestral tree of the kings of Judah has been cut down. That would be the line of Jesus in the book of Matthew. It's the first thing you read in the New Testament. He can't be the man of chapter 11. Not, not just because that line was banished with Jeconia when Babylonia took over, uh, defeated the Jews, and destroyed the second temple, but because he doesn't come from the stump. That's why it's written that way. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples, nations shall seek his counsel, and his abode shall be honored. Again, Isaiah 11.10. The abode of the righteous servant is humble when the Lord cuts him off from the land of the living, the world of material things in society. In Isaiah 53, verse 8. And in the end, the abode of the servant is one to be honored. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. From a poor man to a rich man, with the many as his portion, and the multitude as his spoil, prosperous and held in high regard by many and a multitude of the Jewish people. Verse 14, as many wondered about you, how marred his appearance is from that of a man, and his features from that of people. Russian. That's, that's again from Shabbat.org's and, and the commentary comes from, from them too. They have the commentary of Rashi on that. 
as many wonder his answer commentary as many peoples wondered about them when they saw them in their humble state and said to one another how marred is his israel's it's in brackets appearance from that of a man see how their features are darker than those of other people so as we see with our eyes this teeth verse 14 just as many were appalled at him so marred was his appearance unlike that of man his form beyond human semblance commentary so marred was his appearance unlike that of man based on isaiah 53 verse 10 and its primary purpose this is the beginning of identifying the righteous servant as a man with disfigurement blemished with disease he is not a man without defect such as lambs for sin offerings and rams for guilt offerings in the Torah that would be Leviticus if I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents and surgical operations at one time before healing, together with my con congenital disfigurement, my right shoulder and arm is withered, my appearance and features would be marred from that of a man and people, unlike that of normal men. That's important because if you can find a way to describe to describe uh, this man as so marred and his parents, I mean, it sounds like somebody you never want to look upon. It. But in this verse, verse 15, it is said, So shall he cast down many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for what had not been told them they saw, and what they had not heard they gazed. Rashi. What had not been told them, his answer, commentary, concerning any man they saw in him. They gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Uh, he just puts a Hebrew word in here. I, I don't know. They gazed. It says Hebrew, Hebrew letters. And then again, he says they gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Rashi. So now, even he, his hand, will become powerful. And he will cast down the horns of the nations who scattered him. That would be the Jewish people scattering the nations. Becoming powerful. Shall shut. They shall shut their mouths out of great bewilderment for, he says, honor. They're going to shut their mouths, all this, uh, see what they had never uh, been told and hear what they had never heard. Or honor. Keith. Just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them, shall behold what they never have heard. My answer to that, nations, the Gentiles, startled, and kings, leaders of nations, silenced. By seeing God's righteous servant, God's servant David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses as one man. And hearing that God's righteous servant arrives in the time to come of Jeremiah 31 and the day of the Lord. That God's righteous servant is the only man to come who is described in the scripture and is inherently and implicitly the anointed one David, Elijah, the prophet like Moses, of whom there is no description for identification. That the Jewish people throughout the world will be forgiven by God of all their inequities and sins by God's written word in the day of the Lord. 
That would be the new part of the new covenant, the new inclusion from Jeremiah 31. That heaven is being created for only the Jewish people. Christians will be surprised at that, as will Muslims. That God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile, according to the scripture. That Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant is familiar with disease and crushed with disease, blemished, and could never be an offer for sacrifice. No man of Isaiah 53 can fit an offer of sacrifice. That's why God blemishes him. That's why God chooses to crush him with disease, to make sure that just doesn't happen. Because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do with Leviticus. That a host of the Lord's host is a man and divine beings. That the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile host of the Lord's host and a harbinger of God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant becomes a man and divine beings when God's spirit, who is the angel of his presence, and he is a person, the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit alights upon him in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, that God would really redeem the Jewish people and in the same manner that he did in the Hebrew Bible with one man. At the time to come of Jeremiah 31 began when the state of Israel was created in 1948. That God's righteous servant fulfills and completes the remaining six or so prophecies of God in the day of the Lord. Okay, this is uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1, begins with quotes, and the quotes end after verse 6. The first speakers of Isaiah 53 are the witnesses of the righteous servant, in the quoted multiple verses 1 through 6, the many who are made righteous, by God's righteous servant. That's what the story is about. Verse 1. Who would have believed our report? And to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Rashi. Who would have believed our report? Rashi. Commentary. So will the nations say to one another, Were we to hear from others what we see it would be unbelievable. I'm not certain what they see, but I think it's the Messianic era. Which is never going to occur. So I don't know how you can base your opinions, and I know Jews for Judaism for sure doesn't. Not so much totally a saying of outreach Judaism. If you're going to base a description on a man you're trying to find on an event that has not occurred, whether it will or will not, what about the man who's being described, if that is the case? What have you done? What if you don't recognize him, utter destruction comes to the land of Israel? And right now, that would be the destruction of 7 million Israeli Jews. If you had been told by a prophet, both of you two, Jews for Jews, you, outright Jews, if, if your organizations have been told by a prophet, God said he was going to raise up armies if we didn't do this and we didn't do that. And we know what happened. Syria defeated the port of the North Kingdom, South Kingdom, Judah. The Babylonians defeated and deported. And then Rome destroyed and defeated all of them and dispersed the Jews throughout the world. Because why? Because the prophet wasn't listening to it. The arm of the Lord. This is still Rashi. Like this, with greatness and glory, to whom was it revealed until now? He's, not a lot of explanation there, I'm not sure. Key. Who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? My commentary. The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with sin forgiveness? that is delivered by the messenger Elijah, who receives it from the angel of the covenant, Elijah being a man of heaven, of course, who is the angel of his presence, 
the Holy Spirit that alights upon the anointed one. In Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 2. By the covenant of friendship that comes with his servant David, when he, and it's God, sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy Mount Zion in Jerusalem. I gotta see, I lost track here a little bit. Oh, who can believe what we have heard? Okay, that's what all these bias. By speaking to his prophet, again, as he spoke to Moses face to face and friend to friend, and all by and with one man the Lord calls my righteous servant. Chapter 12 of the laws concerning King Moshiach of Ramnath. That Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will, therefore, be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their Creator to the full extent of human potential. Yet God simply says, and this comes through the two covenants of friendship in the sentence uh, in Jeremiah 31, see a time is coming, Jerusalem is rebuilt. At the end of that it says, they shall never be defeated and dispersed again. Here's what those say for the day of the Lord the era of the Moshiach or the times of the anointed one in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Yet God simply says he will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil, never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. And again, these kind of go in hand with see that the time is coming, the desolate land will bloom again, as I paraphrase it, of Jeremiah 31. They shall no more be carried off by famine. They shall have to bear again. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. His presence shall rest over them. And when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. Who would believe that one man fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in the day of the Lord? The remaining prophecy to be fulfilled is the delivery of two specific covenants and the arrival of God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous, the anointed one, a shepherd, God calls my servant David, Elijah, who was taken to heaven and returns and recounsels the members of the Jewish families one to the other through Judaism, Judaism, and righteousness, and the prophet like Moses. He wrote the Torah at the command and direction of God. The witnesses were poor, and who would believe them? That they had not been told by their wise men, sages, rabbis, theologians, that God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile. In the beginning. Isaiah 63 says God comes from a dawn that is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity. It means he is coming from a Christian country. In addition, a dawn, uh, which is long since gone, is in the country Jordan, east of the River Jordan. It's Gentile lands. He's coming from Gentile lands. And there are the people, the Jewish people, none are with him. He comes with a Gentile. Remember the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua asked him, are you an Israelite or one of us? He says, no. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. Now I've come. And then we never see him again. It's just three short verses. What are they about? 
And they're about a man in divine beings being a host of the Lord's host. He comes with a Gentile. Well, Jesus was a Jewish man who came from Nazareth. Can you see God working in this? <laughs> the Jewish people. Isaiah 53 can't be him. He's a Jew. And God comes with a Gentile. It's not like, I mean, Cyrus of Persia was a Gentile. Elijah's a Gentile. He, he's, he's, he, he, he's a Tishbite. You can't find a clan of Tishbites in any of the tribes according to the genealogies provided. And he is an inhabitant. He's not from, he lives in Ramoth Gilead. Just to give you a frame of reference, he may as well have lived in Adam. It's a, it's a territory east of the River Jordan, north of Adam, and it's Arabs and Assyrians. And he lives there. The Jewish people did not come from Adam. They began in the Promised Land. Returned from Egypt in the Exodus and were not allowed to pass through a dawn. Huh. And returned from Europe after the Holocaust. Well, how's God coming anywhere if he doesn't have a man with him? How, how do we know anything about him if a man doesn't speak the words God tells him to speak? Did you think it was going to be a day of the Lord and he wasn't going to have a Moses? He's got a new covenant to deliver. It has to do with the first covenant. Well, who delivered it? Moses. It can't be the Jewish people. Okay, he's got to have a guy. One man. And he's got him described. He's a servant and he's righteous. So was King David. So was Elijah. And so was Moses. All servants. All righteous. One term. God's righteous servant. And I'm to believe from Rashi, Jews from Judaism, outreach Judaism, that today the Jews are the righteous servants. Good luck convincing me. The witness report that they had never heard that the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile and the harbinger of God's righteous servant who becomes the host of the Lord's host. It's, it's easy to understand. A man of divine beings is not an angel. A man of divine beings is a man that the spirit alights upon and like Ezekiel enters, God is in his spirit and then he speaks. We get that from Ezekiel. Chapter 11, Isaiah. The Spirit of God lights upon him. God is in his spirit. He is now a man of divine beings. Any prophet that said God says in his books was a man of divine beings. You know, it's a task. It can be one task. It can be many tasks. One man just had to wrestle with Jacob. And God spoke. The divine beings, I know Judaism doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit for some unknown reason as a person. I don't know what could be more clear. There's just too many scriptural references. But that's a man of divine beings. Spirit lines on him. God's right there too. It's a man of divine beings, not an angel. The witness had never heard that the divine beings are the Holy Spirit who is the angel of his presence of Isaiah 63. An angel whose angelic body is not the form of a human with wings, but the very Spirit of God. And God. The very angel who went before the Israelites in the Exodus, and God was in him. Quote, this is God. I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him. For he will not pardon your offenses since my name is Hashem. Since Hashem is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, that would be God, not me. I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. It's Exodus chapter 23, verses 20-22. The witnesses have never heard that God created his spirit, is in his spirit, and his spirit is the body of the angel of his presence and the angel of the Lord. How the angel of the Lord is in the burning bush and God speaks to Moses. How a man divine beings wrestled with Jacob and God spoke to Jacob, renaming him Israel. 
how the ground was holy, where Joshua fell to the ground before a Gentile with drawn sword and asked, What does my Lord command his servant? The captain of the Lord's host answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. It's Joshua chapter 5, 14 through 15. Those are the very words God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. The Lord is with the captain, and where the Lord is, so is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, a man in divine things. How Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead, an Arab Assyrian town and land east of the river Jordan, is also a Gentile, host of the Lord's host. Okay, this one's a little involved, and I'm really trying to press through. So I'm I'll just uh, refer you to the book where this comes from. It's called Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord. It's about 280 some odd pages. It has a long, almost 35 page summary of one paragraph of each chapter, which is uh, really helpful. But it's, it's a lot more than just Isaiah 53. <clears throat> and God dictated it to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. Now Ezekiel is the host of the Lord's host, a man in divine names. This is uh, Ezekiel, it's in quotes. I'll give you the chapter in verse in a second. And he said to me, O mortal, stand on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard what was being spoken to me. To God, they show God saying those words, but Ezekiel you can't hear them until the Spirit is in him. And God is in his Spirit. He tells us, the angel, obey him, because my name, I am in him. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, but Ezekiel does not hear God speaking until at the same moment the Spirit enters him and sits him upon his feet. A spirit of God entering a man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, who is spirit, alighted upon him and that God is in him. They could not believe how the Lord is symbolized in the story where he appeared and spoke to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre as three men standing near him. The three men represent a host of the Lord's host. It's a man with divine beings. It's three persons. In my case, it's the person of Keith McCarty. It's the person of God. And it's the person of the Holy Spirit. All right here. And it's not new. This is all throughout the biblical, the, the Hebrew Bible. It just wasn't revealed to you. That's why nobody can believe it when they the commentary of Rashi and myself on Isaiah 53. I just completed a video uh, covering Isaiah 52 verses 13 through 15, which begins the description of the righteous servant. This is literally Isaiah 53 of the Hebrew Bible. In addition, uh, and that was commentary of myself and Rashi, he does not comment on verse 1 of Isaiah 53. And I went through that of my own in the previous uh, video. So I'm picking up on verse 2 of Isaiah 53, and it begins with Rashi's commentary. Rashi is using a version of of a translation of the Hebrew Bible from Shabbat.org, where you can also find his commentary. Now, I haven't changed anything. <clears throat> so I'll begin with his commentary in Midrash form, uh, followed by my own, and I will repeat verse 2, but it will be with the Jewish Publication Society's translation 
of the uh, Leningrad Codex begun in 1956. Verse 2. And he came up like a sapling before it, and like a root from dry ground. He had neither form nor comeliness. And we saw him, that he had no appearance. Now shall we desire him? Rashi. And he came up like a sapling before it. His commentary on that part of the verse. This people, before this greatness came to it, was a very humble people, and it came up by itself like a sapling of the saplings of the trees. And like a root, his commentary, he came up from dry land, neither form. His commentary, had he in the beginning, nor comeliness, in the beginning. And we saw him that he had no appearance. Now shall we desire him? His commentary, and when we saw him from the beginning without an appearance, how could we desire him? Now shall we desire him? This is a question. That's the end of his commentary. This is mine. From the JPS, verse 2. For he has grown by his favor like a tree crown. Like a tree trunk out of arid ground, he had no form or beauty that we should look at him, no charm that we should find him pleasing. Now shall we desire him, my commentary. If a dry land was a Christian country, and his form was a Gentile, under the Jewish law, the Halakha, in the beginning, would he be attracted to the Jewish people? Not at all. But if he comes from a Christian country, with God, to Israel and converts Orthodox to Judaism and becomes an Israeli citizen, the answer is yes, he would be. Rashi on verse 3, despised and rejected by men, a man of pains and accustomed to illness, and as one who hid his face from us, despised, and we held him of no account. Despised and rejected by men was he. Okay, was he is the beginning of his commentary. Despised and rejected by men, his commentary, was he. So is the custom of this prophet. He mentions all Israel as one man. Example, 44, verse 2. Fear not, my servant Jacob. 44, verse 1. And now, hearken, Jacob, my servant. Here too, chapter 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall, he said, concerning the house of Jacob. A Hebrew word is an expression of prosperity. From 1 Samuel, chapter 18, verse 14. And David was successful. Again, a Hebrew word in parentheses. In all his ways. And as one who hides his face from us, his commentary, because of their intense shame and humility, they were as one who hides his face from us with their faces bound up in concealment in order that we not see them like a plagued man who hides his face and is afraid to look. My commentary. 
verse 3. He was despised, shunned by men, a man of suffering, familiar with the disease. As one who hid his face from us, he was despised. We held him of no account. Despised, shunned by men. My commentary. He will be despised and shunned and held of no account simply for declaring that he is the Lord's righteous servant, described in Isaiah 53. Christianity, with God's wrath passed to them, and the rabbis were reckoned with and dismissed. Quote, shall see what has not been told them. So behold, what they never have heard. That's from Isaiah 52, 15. That is part of the lead-in to the description of God's righteous servant. Gentiles will despise and shun the man who startles nations and silences their leaders, who are, by the way, the witnesses, according to Jews for Judaism, these kings and these leaders, for announcing that he is the anointed one the Jewish people have been waiting for, and that Jesus cannot be the man described in Isaiah 53. The Jewish people will despise and shun him for the reason they expect and have been taught. The anointed one is Jewish, not a Gentile. And the era of exaltation, redemption, and restoration they have been taught will not be occurring. It is the nature of people to reject, despise, and hold of no account a man who has no visible proof to substantiate his claims that God speaks to him as God spoke to Moses. That he is a man prophesied to come in the Hebrew Bible. That he is a messenger and deliverer of covenants of God. That the Spirit of the Holy God has alighted upon him. And that he offered himself for guilt to God. The man is suffering familiar with disease. My commentary. God's righteous servant will be a man who has a life full of injuries and wounds, accustomed to illness and disease, who hid his face from us. He was despised. We held him of no account. My commentary. A man who is despised and held on no account is not going to go out among the people until the perception of him changes. And he is asked to. Rashi says, because of their intense shame and humility, they were as one who hid his face from us with their faces bound up in concealment in order that we not see them like a plagued man who hides his face and is afraid to look. When have all of the Jewish people as one man been intensely ashamed of being Jews? I'd like to hear the answer to that. When have they bound their faces in concealment that the people not see them? I'd like somebody to tell me that. The world often secluded them in ghettos, but that is the shame of the Gentiles, not God's people. And it most certainly was not all of them. Rashi on verse 4. Indeed, he bore our illnesses and our pains. He carried them. Yet we accounted him as plagued, smitten by God, and oppressed. Rashi. Indeed, he bore our illnesses. Hebrew, a Hebrew word. An expression of but in all places. But now we see that this came to him not because of his low state, but that he was chastised with pains so that all the nations be atoned for with Israel's suffering. The illness that should rightfully have come upon us, the Jewish people, he bore. Well, is the Jewish people bearing this or not? 
Who's been, and that's vicarious suffering, by the way. You can tiptoe around it all you want. But you got to remember who wrote Isaiah 53. And you got to remember he knows all things from the beginning. He knows there's going to be an organization like Jews for Judaism. He knows there's going to be a Russia that says this is the Jewish people. Just as he knows the Christians are going to try to put a man in there that is an unblemished lamb for sin forgiveness. Even though the only reference you have to sins, for the most part, is he was wounded for our sins. That's wounded. That's not crucified. That's not made into a human sacrifice for sins. But they do change the word guilt to sin in verse 10. They certainly do. It doesn't matter if the man's blemished. God knew it was coming. He even knew there'd be somebody out there who used it to be translated literally as a guilt offering and take it to Leviticus to make up human sacrifices the Christians do. <coughs> Excuse me. As the Christians do. But that's in another video. It's, it's beautiful prose by God. Yet we accounted him we thought that he was hated by the omnipresent, but he was not so. And this, this is the king speaking. But he was pained because of our transgression and crushed because of our iniquities. Nevertheless, we have vicarious suffering here. But that he, Israel, was chastised with pains, so that all the nations be atoned for, with Israel's suffering. God's teaching is, one man cannot bear the sins of another. He can't atone for somebody else. My commentary, verse 4. Yet it was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. It was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. My commentary. The sickness is not being righteous. The witnesses suffer the sickness of not being righteous and not being in right standing with God. God's righteous servant which is what this story is all about. You start with the problem. You come up with the resolution. The problem is unrighteousness. And the man described becomes the righteous servant of God who makes the many righteous with his knowledge. However, he has to be prepared. He has to be prepared. And this is where Ezekiel becomes the key to Isaiah 53. You can see God sees him and take him through the fire refinement. And he tells Ezekiel, I'm going to make your forehead like that in it, hard as flint. Because of the people I'm sending you to to be a prophet for, the exiles of Assyria and Babylonia. God's righteous servant suffers by the chastisement, punishment, bruising, crushing, maltreatment laid on him by the words and power of God who afflicts him with disease, affliction, to make him suitable for his purpose that might prosper. A purpose includes his righteous servant, making the many righteous by his knowledge, and the building of the third temple. If Israel's the Jewish people, I'd like to know why they haven't built God's house for him. Why do they sit back and let Islam sit on the temple mount of the Holy God of Israel? It's a very good question. The righteous servant bearing up to this fire of refinement is bearing the illness and pain of unrighteousness of the Jewish people to be recognized as a prophet. That in and of itself will draw the Jewish people back to Judaism, recounts of the families one to the other, and make the many righteous. That's, that's, that's Elijah. 
Again, the purpose of the man described in Isaiah 53 is the same purpose of Elijah in Malachi 3. If it's going to describe any man, particularly from the Hebrew Bible or even the biblical times, it's Elijah. You don't have to open it up to someone outside of the Bible like, I don't know, Jesus. We accounted him as plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. My commentary. Plague means to cause worry, pain or difficulty to someone or something over a period of time. Smitten in biblical times meant struck as with a severe hard blow. Afflicted means grievously affected or troubled as by a disease. This describes a man that God does not like. A sinner whose life is full of bad events, sick, suffer. God's righteous servant will have had persistent hardships and troubles, severely injured, and have been grievously affected, especially by disease, based on these words used. None of which describes all of the Jewish people at any time. Even from this, this idea that the Gentiles and their leaders, these kings, are seeing the great exaltation in the Messianic era of the Jewish people that has yet to occur, and in my opinion will not. <clears throat> and I've given all the reasons for that that need to be given. But one thing they don't do, when, when, when did the Gentiles say, well, we, we hate the Jews because they're plagued, because they're diseased, because they're afflicted? Where is that? I don't see that. Rashi on verse 5. That he was pained because of our transgressions. Crushed because of our iniquities. And the chastisement of our welfare was upon him. And with his wound we were healed. Rashi. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him. His commentary. The chastisement due to the welfare that we enjoyed came upon him. For he was chastised so that there be peace for the entire world. Now here's a man who's being chastised and wounded to atone for the sins of the world. By Russia. It's my commentary. But he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole. By his bruises we were healed. The book of Ezekiel, again, is the key to understanding Isaiah 53. The purpose of Ezekiel was to be a prophet to the exiles of Assyria of Babylon, and to prepare him, God said, I will make your face as hard as theirs. And your forehead is brazen as theirs. I will make your forehead like adamant, harder than flint. Do not be dismayed by them. And God maltreats and punishes him for the punishment of the house of Israel and Judah for their sins. Doesn't say for their sins, but that's, <laughs> yeah, that's what the punishment is for, for not following his laws and commandments. So for 430 days he's pinned to the ground. Crushed and bruised, eating nothing but bread, chastised by the words of God. The Assyrian Babylonian exiles were made whole and healed only if they listened to and heeded the teachings of Ezekiel. Of repentance and restitution. God's righteous servant is one crushed and chastised by the world to have his life based on God's description of him, with persistent hardships and troubles, grievously affected, especially by disease, and severely injured at one time or another, that would be smitten as much as anything, the hard blow. A man of many bruises and scars. Oftentimes the Christians will say, by his stripes 
we are healed. Which would be a reference to the marks left by the whips and the scourging and the uh, passion of the Christ. And uh, I would say it's scars. These are the qualities that identify him as God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous. Then to make him suitable for his purposes, God punishes the righteous servant, the man described, chastises, maltreats, crushes, and bruises him in a fire of refinement. To make this Gentile's face as hard as the Jewish people. His forehead is brazen as theirs. His forehead like adamant. Harder than flint, so that he will not fear the Jewish people or be dismayed by them. The righteous servant bearing up to this fire of refinement is bearing the unrighteousness of the Jewish people to be recognized as a prophet of God. But it's just figurative language. I'm having to go through this trauma that he puts upon me for 13 years so that I can be suitable to do the things I'm, I'm doing right now. And yet it still hasn't stopped, not by any stretch of the imagination, is he still not working me over. <clears throat> but it's to make, the, it's to deliver the covenant. You're forgiven, everybody is sin free. Now, you gotta be in right standing. That's the new part of the teaching. You, you've got to be observant Jews. You had to, you had to study Torah with all you have and show God how much you respect him, that you're back, that you did what you said you're gonna do, unlike this false idol, Jesus the Christ. And that falls into what Elijah's supposed to do, bring the families back together, one to the other. And that's not vicarious atonement. It's just, again, it's figurative language. And God had all kinds of purposes for it, some that I've already mentioned. This wounded and this and that, that and this, but he does it in Ezekiel too. And it's just to make him, his forehead, it, again, I, I use this all the time, it's like a cadet in the army deciding he wants to be a Green Beret and going through that program, or a Navy SEAL. And I think even a better one is the uh, a breaking a wild horse, a stallion. You know, I'm from Texas, I've seen this. Uh, it's brutal. And they're tougher than anything you see in a movie sometimes. They absolutely beat that horse scentless until he stops bucking. And he's ready to let him run. And it works every time, by the way. Rashi says, indeed, he bore our illness, an expression of but in all places. But now we see that this came to him, not because of his low state, but that he was chastised with pain, so that all the nations be atoned for with Israel's suffering. That's vicarious suffering. That's against God's teachings. So he's using human beings for sacrifice especially six million of the Holocaust, calling them guilt offerings. That guilt is translated, God chose to crush him for disease, that he offered himself for guilt. That's the translation. It is not literally retranslated by Tobias Singer to be guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus. You think I'm hot about it. God is hot about it. I, I, I'll just use that word. The illness that should rightfully have come upon us, he bore. So again, this is the kings looking at the Jews. They are now exalted, held high. The world is speaking Hebrew. Uh, the descendant of David, the king Moshiach, has gathered his kingdom. And now these witnesses. Uh, in some particular order, I'm not quite sure. They don't make it clear that these people who say... This description of God's prophet like Moses in the day of the Lord is uh, all of his chosen people. This is a God chastised, which means to discipline, especially by corporal punishment. 
I usually think of chastise as just being verbal, but this, the, I looked it up, especially by corporal punishment, all of the Jewish people, so that all of the Gentiles will be atoned for their sins for Israel's suffering. This is the ideology of the Christians. Others suffer so that you can be atoned for the bad that you do. Vicarious suffering of one man for the sins of another, contrary to God's teachings. Verse 6, Rossi. We all went astray like sheep. We have turned each one on his way, and the Lord accepted his prayers for the iniquity of all of us. Rashi. We all went astray like sheep. His commentary. Now it is revealed that all the heathens, nations, there will be Gentiles, have erred, accepted his prayers. He, God, accepted his prayers and was appeased concerning the iniquity of all of us that he did not destroy. Accepted prayers, Hebrew, again a Hebrew word, Espriad and capital O period, F period, this is Rashi, an expression of supplication. My commentary on verse 6. Verse 6, we all went astray like sheep, each going his own way, and the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. Again, this is verse 6. Now, in verse 10, God crushes him with disease that he would make himself an offering for guilt. And here it is, the guilt of all of us being put on him. It still has absolutely nothing to do with human sacrifice under the animal atonement and worship law, sacrificial atonement uh, laws of Leviticus. We all want to stray like sheep, my commentary. The Jewish people, who are the witnesses and the speakers of verses 1 through 6, the multiple quote verses, stop following the laws of God in one manner or another before they became righteous by the knowledge of the righteous servant and belief in him. And the Lord visited upon him the guilt of all of us. My commentary. This would happen in the day of the Lord when God requires a man to be his visible representation and speak and write his words, as Moses did. In the day of the Lord, a Gentile is tested by God, and upon passing the test, the man becomes the righteous servant, David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses. He accepts God's offer of possibly having long life after being crushed with disease in return of his offering of himself for guilt. It's a covenant between the two. A covenant between the God of Israel and the Gentile. The guilt of the witnesses built the, visited upon him. Figurative language. You can't, how, how do you take somebody else's guilt and put it on another person? You can't do it. The guilt they have for sin and emotion. Quote, this is from, um, I'll let you know in just a second. Taking the mantle which had dropped from Elijah, he, that would be Elisha, his attendant, struck the water and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And again, Elijah is a Gentile. He's an inhabitant of Ramoth Gilead. That's Arab Assyrian territory. And he's a Tishbite. There's no Tishbites in the genealogy that we have of any of the, the tribes. There's no such clan. And that's what, every time you see his name, it's the Tishbite. Sometimes the Tishbite and the habitant, which, which doesn't mean he came from there. It means he lives there. Even though he was with God for quite a, a number of years, doing tasks as a man and divine being. 
As he too struck the water, it parted to the right and to the left, and Elisha crossed over. That's 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 14. Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Elisha is the only person in the Hebrew Bible to refer to God as the God of Elijah rather than the God of Israel or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of a single Gentile. The Gentile Elijah, who returns as a Gentile in the day of the Lord, Okay, this is the last of the verses by the witnesses of God's righteous servant. The second speaker of Isaiah 53 is Isaiah himself, the prophet, in verses 7 through 10. The importance that God would have this account of the God of Israel being the God of a single Gentile is that he's not the God of any other Gentile. Just one. So at this moment, he is the God of the Jewish people. When this is written, two kings. He's the God of the Jewish people and one Gentile. So here's the question. Does Elijah need to convert? You have to think that one for it. Rushing on, verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he would not open his mouth. Like a lamb to the slaughter he would be brought, and like an ooh that is mute before her shears, and he would not open his mouth. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, Rashi's commentary. Behold, he was oppressed by taskmasters and people who exert pressure. And he was afflicted, Rosh's commentary, with verbal taunts, Sephardic and O.F. Yet he would not open his mouth. He would suffer and remain silent like the lamb that is brought to the slaughter and like the ewe that is meat before her shearers. Have the Jews always been silent? I haven't noticed that. They seem to speak their mind quite well. Uh, even under pain of death sometimes. And he would not open his mouth. This refers to the lamb brought to the slaughter. But uh, it's a metaphor for it. My commentary on verse 7. He was maltreated, yet he was submissive. He did not open his mouth. Like a sheep being led to slaughter. Like a ooh, dumb before those who shear her. He did not open his mouth. He was maltreated, yet he was submissive. My commentary. This verse can be identified in the book of Ezekiel. God maltreats him, not man. Maltreatment is a part of being chastised and punished by the words and power of God to be made suitable for his purpose. With God, you are always submissive. It is necessary to break the will of a man and to temper and calm his soul and emotions. As we find with Moses, a man was such a furious spirit that he committed murder. And yet at the end of his life, they say Moses was the most humble man on earth. That's God telling you that Moses went through this process too, as Ezekiel did and as the righteous servant will. Ezekiel said he went in bitterness and the furious spirit in the hand of God. That's the fire of violence. The chastisement, punishment, maltreatment, crushing, and bruising in God's fire of refinement is to remove this bitterness and furious nature of Ezekiel. It is to make a man meek and humble. Again, Moses was called the most humble man on earth at the end of his life. God had him for 40 years. <laughs> he did not open his mouth. Ezekiel was sent to his house and God bound him with the cords of his power so that he could not go out among the people. 
to the people, Ezekiel was silent as a lamb. Rashi does not explain how or when this happened to all the Jewish people as the land of Israel. You see, I mean, when, when you say Israel, you say it's the Jewish people, and you have to start coming up with things like, well, when the Messianic era happens, the Gentiles will start saying these things. Well, that's just made up. Just for Judaism doesn't know what the leaders of the Gentile nations are going to start doing when the Jews are exalted. As we already found out, the whole concept that the world is speaking Hebrew is based on a misconstruction, if you want to call it that, of Zephaniah verse 9. Because verse 8 says, God says, I've got it in for the world when I come back. They're going to bear the passion of my fire. Now, how that's perfecting the nations, I don't know. But what Rambam did is he took this phrase in nine. God said, I will make them a people of pure speech. He said, oh, well, that's the people of the world. If the people of the world are speaking Hebrew, then they have accepted that the Jews have been right all along about God. In other words, two billion Christians will toss out in this time to come of Jeremiah. We'll, we'll say, we've been wrong. <clears throat> Uh, about Jesus all along. He's a false god. Allah means God, but Islam will have to do the same thing. As we believe Allah, we throw that out and accept the God of Israel. Based on making the people of a pure speech. And that's what he says. That's from him. He says all these things, and he says, based on Zebaniah 9. The last thing that's going to happen when Moshiach gets here, when the Jews start saying, he's here. We told you, Christians, we told you the righteous servant wasn't Jesus. It's the descendant of David. That's what our sages say. We knew we had to have a description of him. Do you think the, girl, the world's going to come to peace with the Jewish people? And, of course, the, the world's never going to be at peace to begin. You know, that's just a religious thing that gets thrown out there all the time. It's never going to happen. You can't back it up other than to say God destroys the world. Uh, was it Armageddon? In any event, that's not God's world. And if he was going to change it like that, why didn't he change it in biblical times for those poor people living through that? Why did he let hundreds of thousands of Jewish people be crucified? Why did he allow programs? Why did he allow the Holocaust? What's going on? Well, I'm quite certain the righteous servant can give you answers to each and all of that. But the main thing is, is God's making a new heaven for the Jew. And he wants people who are formed by their own life struggles. And he made it tough on them. And that's just him. Look what he did to Ezekiel. Pinned to the ground for over a year. Chastised. He wants the people to the end of time, I'm quite sure, to go through the struggles. He, he doesn't want a lovely heaven on earth because now that means his heaven that he's creating, the spiritual heaven that we see in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10 is uh, completed. Because when God makes angels, he has to form, he has to form their personality. He likes it this way. He wants everybody to have their distinct own person. That he doesn't form himself. Verse 8, Rashi. From imprisonment and judgment he is taken, and his generation, who shall tell? For he was cut off from the land of the living, because of the transgression of my people. A plague befell them. Rashi. From imprisonment and from judgment he was taken. Rosh's commentary. The prophet reports and says that the heathens, nations, will say this at the end of days. When they see that he was taken from the imprisonment, that he was imprisoned in their hands, and from the judgment of torments that he suffered until now. So the suffering of the Jews has now ended according to Rosh. Okay? And the nations now realize it was us that did it to them. Okay. And his generation. 
the years that passed over him. Who shall tell? Much is commentary. The tribulations that befell him, for from the beginning he was cut off and exiled from the land of the living, that is, the land of Israel, for because of the transgression of my people, this plague came to the righteous among them. My commentary. Verse 8. By oppressive judgment he was taken away. Who could describe his abode? For he was cut off from the land of the living through the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. By oppressive judgment he was taken away. The oppressive judgment is being guilty and receiving a sentence of imprisonment in his home. Ezekiel, go to your house. And the maltreatment, chastisement, punishment, bruising, and crushing for the sins of the Jewish people. That was said just to infuriate Ezekiel, a priestly man, a Levite, I believe. And his figurative language. Until suitable for God's purpose. What's the purpose? To be the righteous servant, have the knowledge for it. To heal those witnesses, the Jewish people, who are just sick with what they've done with their lives, not following the commandments and laws of God. God is using the verses symbolically with the offering for guilt being shown as a guilty plea. This is another way to look at it for being shown as a guilty plea before a judge of crimes not committed by the defendant. Who can describe his abode? This would be the jailer. The jailer is a spirit. The spirit seized me and carried me away. I went and buried him in the fury of my spirit while the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Ezekiel 3 and 14. The prison. And the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And he spoke to me and said to me, Go, shut yourself up in your house. That's the prison. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 24. The chains. As for you, O mortal cords have been placed upon you, and you have been bound with them, and you shall not go out amongst the people. It's taken from the land of the living. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 25. All of Israel will be able to describe the abode of God's righteous servant in the day of the Lord. And why is that? Because the day of the Lord is today. The Roman dispersal has returned. That's what Jeremiah 31 is all about. And from Jeremiah 31, you land right inside of Malachi 3, the day of the Lord. Everybody's going to know. And be able to describe his abode. You can't describe Jesus' abode. It's never described. Because of social media and phones with cameras. It's today. Isaiah 53 is prophetic. Prophetic of a man that God's going to use as his Moses. And for many other tasks. Make many righteous. Clear the way as Elijah would for me. So that the temple can be rebuilt. That I bring with my covenant of friendship that comes with David. When David's here, and I have a reckoning, and I dismiss all the shepherds. And it is an abode to the honor in Isaiah 11. Well, of course, Jews for Judaism, not rich Judaism, say Isaiah 53 has nothing to do with the anointed one, the Moshiach, the descendant of David from chapter 11. Has nothing to do with him. There is no description of him according to Jews for Judaism and outreach Judaism that God is just going to let y'all guess. Or as Rendam says, well, if he studies Torah, he just starts making things up. This isn't in the scripture. If he studies Torah all night, he does this and he does that and he builds the temple, then we shall know it is Moshe. We should concern ourselves with Elijah. Who knows if he comes before or after David? We should study Torah. Uh, other destruction? Well, I think it's important you find Elijah. I think it's important you identify him. You know what? Better have a description of him, too. 
And anyone can be the prophet like Moses. That's based on his deeds. It's what he does. Primarily write the words of God dictated to him as the Torah was. For he was cut off from the land of the living. Being cut off from something means you cannot have it or get to it. Cut off from the land of the living by a man given long life means cut off from society and the material things of the world. To the sin of my people who deserved the punishment. Ezekiel suffers the punishment of the houses of Israel and Judah for 430 days. Guess what? When God had Ezekiel write Ezekiel, you think he didn't know about Isaiah 53, that he had Isaiah right? But nobody has been able to see this until this Gentile, an uh, atheist for 50 years, comes along 13 years ago. I'd like somebody to try to explain that. I just became the smartest religious Jew of all time to be able to see these things and to know what a man of divine means is, to know what a host of the Lord's host is, to be able to describe what are these, what clearly appear to be vicarious atonement verses really about. And that Isaiah 53 is for the day of the Lord, so God has a representative, and it has to be somebody described. I assure you, without a description, it would be an impossible task for any man with this rebellious breed, as God calls them, Jewish people, stiffnecks, it's an old one. <laughs> I tell God, yeah, that's pretty tough in my own life. He said, I'm well aware of that, Mr. Keith. <laughs> there was no vicarious suffering except, I don't know, I'm back into Ezekiel here. Verse 9, Rashi. And he gave his grave to the wicked and to the wealthy with his kinds of death, because he committed no violence. And there was no deceit in his mouth. And he gave his grave to the wicked. Rashi's commentary. He subjected himself to be buried according to anything the wicked of the heathens, nations, would decree upon him, for they would penalize him with death and the burial of donkeys in the intestines of the dogs. Did I mention that these rhymes were first meant for the people of antiquity? I don't know what they just said. I had no idea. To the wicked, Rashi's commentary, according to the will of the wicked, he, and this he is, of course, Israel. This is Jewish people all of them together. He was willing to be buried and he would not deny the living God. I guess that means die and not convert. Very descriptive. And to the wealthy with his kinds of death, and part of the problem is, is this translation. I mean, it's used for Judaism, does it? We have a, a modern translation, 30 years spent on it, starting from scratch at the oldest Hebrew Bible, the Leningrad Codex by the JPS. It's very good. It's very, very good. 30 years, there was Orthodox involved, Reformed and Conservative rabbis, linguists, professors from universities, people who spend their life at just this one thing. Translation. And to the will of the ruler, he subjected himself to all kinds of death that he decreed upon him because he did not wish to agree to the denial of the Torah. Okay, so it has to do with conversion. To commit evil and to rob, like all the heathens, nations, among whom he lived. And there was no deceit in his mouth. Watch his commentary. To accept idolatry, to accept a pagan deity as God, 
Okay. Verse 9. And his grave was set among the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no injustice and spoken no falsehood. This verse says the righteous servant of God was poor, but dies a rich man. The righteous servant of God becomes poor when God cuts him off from the world, the land of the living. And then he is given the many as a portion, receives the multitude of his spoil, and his abode will be honored. So he's going to get rich again. He's going to be able to buy a home again. He will die a rich man. Verse 10. Rush it. And the Lord wished to crush him. He made him ill. And again, he's exposed to death, so this, this, this illness has to be fairly severe. If his soul makes itself restitution, that's an interesting concept, because your soul is inanimate. It's a non-person. It's a non-person. How is his soul? So are we talking about himself or not? It's hard to tell, and this comes up with the Christians too in their rendition. Their rendition says, if you offer the soul of Jesus, he shall receive on one. It's the funniest red thing. I mean, it's just, what are you even talking about? How do you offer Jesus' soul? Is that by accepting him as your Savior? Well, why does it say he gets on one? <laughs> you know, it, it, you got to get a better translation. That's, that's the story. And, and these, these things, and this guilt offering, this offering oneself for guilt means guilt offering. Let's go to human sacrifice. You know, when your interpretation is so far off of what God would possibly be intending, I mean, I can see what he would be saying, I suppose, is that uh, God said, well, yeah, it was just for animals, but, you know, since I'm telling you it's a guilt offering for a man to scribe, and you say the man's Israel, well, it's okay to assume that this uh, the sacrificial system that was done away with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before. It's okay to resurrect it and, uh, and think that's what I mean. Now, you know, at one point you got to say, look, these, some of these prophecies can't happen. And I've been going on and on about this with the Messianic here. You know, you, God can have other purposes. God can just be writing a poem that's uplifting. And it sounds like prophecy to you that I have to be. You know what prophecy is? I'm going to make a new covenant with you. Are you going to do it? Well, when I, when I come back, when I send my angel, and I'll have my messenger with me so he can deliver it to you. I mean, you know, it becomes so easy. It becomes so easy to understand. My commentary. And the Lord wished to crush him. He made him ill. No, this is still rushing. <laughs> and God has prospered Purpose shall prosper in the hands. Rashi. And the Lord wished to crush him and made him ill. His commentary. The Holy One, blessed be he, wished to crush him and to cause him to repent. Therefore, he made him ill. God comes with sin forgiveness. Rids him. It's a new covenant. That is an amendment of the first covenant. If his soul makes itself restitution, etc. Rashi's commentary. Said the Holy One, blessed be he, I will see if his soul will be given and delivered with my holiness to return it to me as restitution for all that he betrayed me. I will pay him his recompense and he will see children, etc. So all the Jewish is one man, Jewish people is one man. They're going to take their souls from their body. Give them to God. He's going to refine them and give them back. Say, okay, now we're eating. But you had to go through that. What else was <laughs> written? It's in quotes. The word so-and-so Hebrew is an expression of ransom that one gives to the one against when he sinned. Amende in O.F. To free from faults, similar to the matter mentioned in the episode of the Philistines. That's 1 Samuel chapter 6 verse 3. Do not send it away empty, but you shall send back with it a guilt offering. <laughs> My comment here. 
But the Lord chose to crush him by disease, that if he made himself an offering for guilt, he might see offspring and have long life, and that through him the Lord's purpose might prosper. But the Lord chose to crush him by disease. God's righteous servant will be familiar with disease and his life crushed because of disease that he is afflicted with by the hand and power of God. That if he made himself an offering for guilt, my commentary, it is an offering, an offering of oneself and soul to God for the guilt of sinning of the Jewish people in return for possibly seeing his children and might have long life. As a covenant, it's a covenant between him and God. That says, I might give you long life you offer yourself for guilt. The offering is only a test of his devotion to God as was the binding of Isaac. When the test of devotion is set before the righteous servant, the new covenant has already arrived and all of the iniquities and sins of the Jewish people are forgiven and God remembers them no more. The guilt and emotion is from not following the laws and teachings of God by the Jewish people. God's forgiveness of the sins removes the guilt. And it's for your speech, but you can't really offer yourself for the guilt of somebody else. I mean, what was you, what do you, what's the suffering? You literally feel their guilt? You feel the guilt of the entirety of the Jewish people? Yeah, I don't think so. But it's just, it's, 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 it's figured in a sense, but um, this is why the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way when God says, I'm going to return and send my messenger to clear the way before me. And then he will return to his temple suddenly. The test of devotion is revealed here with Jeremiah 31 providing when God is coming with the new covenant, the time to come, that is manifested in Malachi 3 by the angel of the covenant. Behold, I am sending my messenger to clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall come to his temple suddenly. As for the angel of the covenant that you desire, he is already coming. One God of Israel, one angel of his presence and the new covenant, and one man, the messenger of the new covenant. That's a man in divine beings, a host of the Lord's host. There are only two covenants that have not been delivered. The new covenant for a time to come in Jeremiah with sin and forgiveness and the covenant of friendship. <clears throat> that comes with the shepherd, servant, and anointed one of God, whom he calls David. That's Moshe. The angel of the covenant must be the angel of the new covenant. The phrase, he is already coming, means he arrives before God, who comes to covenant with a Gentile, before he returns to his temple. He must have a visible representation to speak and write his words, as Moses did to have his temple rebuilt for his return in the day of the Lord. God has to speak to the man to tell him that it was God that afflicted that himself, that afflicted him with the disease and crushed his life. It must be a life-threatening disease or illness, for God tells him that he might receive long life, after God chose to crush him with the disease. And in verse 12, he is exposed to death. God also has to prepare him to be a prophet, as he did Ezekiel, in the fire of refinement in the hand of God by his words and power, while teaching him the scripture to make the many righteous by his knowledge. God is not asking the man to give up his life as a sacrifice. That would be against his teachings to the Israelites through his prophet, not to sacrifice your children. 
And the purpose of the man offering himself for guilt is to receive long life. The reality is there is no guilt or sin for the man to bear. The new covenant with sin forgiveness of all the Jewish people on earth has arrived before the offering is made and no vicarious suffering for the sins or guilt of others has occurred. That is why it is only a test. God removes the guilt. I didn't. By offering myself for the guilt of the Jewish people for their sins. I didn't bear it. What I bared was the fire of refinement to become uh, the righteous servant, the prophet, Elijah, David, prophet like Moses. <clears throat> it is only a test. Now, God knows it's only a test, but I didn't know it was a test. God knows this before he covenants with the man, a covenant that if he makes himself an offering for guilt, God might not let him die of the disease. A test of devotion, trusting that God will not let him die. God had Isaiah write Isaiah 53 just as he had Moses write the Torah at his command and direction. The multiple purposes of how Isaiah 53 is written were no more possible for Isaiah to know than Moses could know the multiple purposes of the Torah and the 1613 laws of God for the Jewish people derived from its books. Isaiah 53 was written with the knowledge of God that the Gentiles would take the book of the children of the book and call it their own. This is the Christians. That they would do it based on the animal, sacrificial, atonement, worship laws of the Torah. The primary purpose of verse 10 is not the test of devotion. It's to make certain that the animal, sacrificial, atonement, worship laws of the Torah cannot be used for the man to scrub. It is the only reason God would crush a man with disease to make him his servant. You cannot offer an animal with defect or blemish. <clears throat> so God blemishes the man. In addition, I was born with defect. You can't offer an animal that has the shoulder that I have and no right breast and withered arm. Defect and blemish, the blemish being the disease. Again, I see every verse, and I'm the exact opposite of Jesus Christ. He's not disfigured, he's perfect. He wasn't crushed with disease, as best I can tell, he was never sick, he's never ill, much less an illness that exposes you to death. And he wasn't exposed to death, he died. No man would refuse God, and God does not need a man's permission to make him a servant. This goes again to why he chose to crush me, the righteous servant, with disease. He doesn't need a man's permission. He's God. In the book of Ezekiel, God seized him and made him suitable for the purpose of being a prophet to the Assyrian Babylonian exiles in his fire refinement. Okay, this will be uh, verse 11, Rashi. From the toil of his soul, he would see, he would be satisfied. With his knowledge, my servant would vindicate the just for many, and their inequities he would bear. Rashi. From the toil of his soul, he would eat and be satisfied, and he would not rob and plunder. With his knowledge, would vindicate the just. Okay, and Rashi comments, My servant would judge justly all those who came to litigate before him, and their inequities he would bear. His, uh, his, Rashi's commentary, He would bear in the manner of all the righteous, as it is said, Numbers chapter 18, verse 1. You and your son, sons shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary.
My commentary on verse 11. Out of his anguish, he shall see it. He shall enjoy it to the full through his devotion. My righteous servant makes the many righteous. It is their punishment that he bears. Out of his anguish, he shall see it. My commentary. Uh, he shall enjoy it to the full through his devotion. My commentary. This is a reference to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, where one of the attributes of the Spirit that alights upon the anointed one is a spirit of devotion and reverence for the Lord. The anguish is the emotional and physical pain Ezekiel suffered and I have suffered and continued to suffer by punishment and the power of God to be made suitable for his purpose. There's a lot more to that, by the way, but that's sufficient for, for what we're doing here. God's righteous servant, when he comes out of God's fire of refinement and the anguish of it, is devoted to God and will enjoy being the teacher of righteousness by his knowledge with long life. Knowledge a Gentile must be taught, not only of the scripture, but of the Jewish people and their history, the Middle East, war, Israel, and its government, and all else he may need to know, like Abraham, a stranger in a strange land of a strange language, and just as Ezekiel was given knowledge in his fire of refinement. Ezekiel says, God said to me, mortal, eat what is offered you. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me this scroll to eat. As he said to me, mortal, feed your stomach and fill your belly with this scroll that I give you. I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey to me. Then he said to me, mortal, go to the house of Israel and repeat my very words to them. That's the way that you tell a story of teaching somebody knowledge and the words of God to be spoken to others in antiquity. I think we all know what he means, eat this school, and it's great knowledge, and it's great to learn, as Ezekiel says. My righteous servant makes the many righteous. It is their punishment that he bears. My commentary. God's righteous servant is a man of pain, suffering, and wounds throughout his life with persistent hardships and troubles, grievously affected, especially by disease, and severely injured at one time or another, as though plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. These are the qualities that identify him as God's righteous servant who makes the many righteous. It is this life that has prepared him to be the teacher of righteousness. And those who listen to and heed him and repent of their future sins, the new covenant having forgiven all past sins, in the practice of Judaism and returning to synagogue, or going to synagogue for the first time, are made righteous. And those <clears throat> who are in right standing with God are entered into the scroll of remembrance of Malachi 3. Those who God has reckoned with and dismissed when his shepherd and servant David arrives, the shepherds, they're sin free, this would be the rabbis, they're sin free, they practice Judaism, but they are not in right standing with God. They fall along with those who do not esteem and revere his name and heed him, though most do. Doesn't matter. You've been dismissed. And part of this for not teaching the reckoning and dismissal and teaching this ridiculous messianic era and not putting your minds to what's been told to you in these books that God had me type. <laughs> the Lord has heard it and noted it, and the scroll of remembrance has been written at his BS. The best concerning those who revere the Lord and esteem his name. And on the day that I am preparing, said the Lord of hosts, they shall be my treasured possession. I will be tender toward them as a man is tender toward a son who ministers to him. 
It's in Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The scroll of remembrance is not the book of life. The day that I am preparing is the day of the Lord. A man who is tender towards a son who ministers to him, ministers to him, is a man who never wants to be without him. For behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 18. For as the new heaven and the new earth which I will make shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed and your name endure. That's Isaiah 66, 22. The new heaven with the name Israel shall endure is heaven with the addition of the angels Israel, when this earth is no more. Heaven is only for the Jewish people. Verse 12, Washington. Therefore, I will allot him a portion in public, and with the strong he shall share plunder, because he poured out his soul to death, and with transgressors he was counted, and he bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. Rossi's commentary on therefore. Because he did this, I will allot him an inheritance and a lot in public with the patriarchs. He poured out his soul to death. Rossi's commentary. Hebrew, uh, some word, an expression like from Genesis 24, 20, and she emptied her pitcher. And with transgressors he was counted. Rashi's commentary. He suffered torments as if he had sinned and transgressed. And this is because of others. Says so again, vicarious suffering. He bore the sin of the many and interceded for the transgressors. Through his sufferings, for good came to the world through him. Well, supposedly. That's an interpretation. It's not sad. It's not, you know, this is descriptive of a man so God can have a prophet like Moses. It's to be able to find a man. It's not about, oh, well, I believe, and based on my interpretation of the scriptures, that all these things are going to happen. And because those things are going to happen, then the Gentiles are going to say this about us as witnesses of how the fact we were so lowly, and now the entire world is speaking Hebrew, practicing Judaism, exalting the Jew, and giving us their stuff. Right. That's what you've done with God's description of four men, David, Elijah, Moses, the prophet like Moses, and his righteous servant. And, and if he's not successful, apparently there's going to be a destruction of the state of Israel someday in the future. My commentary. Assuredly, I will give him the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his spoil. For he exposed himself to death and was numbered among the sinners, whereas he bore the guilt of the many and made intercession for sinners. I will give him the many as his portion. He shall receive the multitude as his spoil. My commentary. Those who believe in him and are made righteous. See, nobody, everybody sinned free, but they got to believe that I am the man with the new covenant. That has been delivered to me from the angel in my capacity as Elijah, because I would know the angel, because Elijah specifically taken to heaven and then he sent back. That's why. That's what it's about. For he exposed himself to death. God's righteous servant is crushed with disease that exposes him to death, but get him all right. Rashi says the Jewish people, as one man, Israel, poured out their soul unto death. But he doesn't tell us when this happened, or will happen, and even can happen with the number of Jews we have today.
the Jewish people as the land of Israel are not described in Isaiah 53. Period. It's a false teaching. And it is a false teaching that rubs God the wrong way. And was numbered among the sinners. God's righteous servant will have been a sinner, a Gentile, not a religious man in the beginning, whereas he bore the Oh, what if they're just making a mistake? That's just their interpretation. Yeah, God would beg to differ with that. And he knows the true answer, doesn't he? Rashi says, he suffered torments as if he had sinned and transgressed. And this is because of others. He bore the sin of the many. The Jewish people as one man Israel became Jesus. Now that's not just according to Rashi, that's according to Jews for Judaism too. Oh, they try to tiptoe around. They try to tiptoe around 5310. But you can't do it. God had it written. And 11 and 12 for that matter. Bearing the sin of the many. You know, what Jesus of Judaism said, well, you know, what happened was, is that now that we've been exalted so high, everybody realizes our low stature was just to bear the suffering that they should be bearing. We should have all buried it together, but they didn't. So we did it by ourselves. And so they've been atoned by us. But that's vicarious suffering. He can't get around it. He tries and he tries and he tries and he can't do it. According to Rush. This is why Rambam and many others would, and of course, Toby Singer went Christian and decided to use human sacrifice. You know, the Christians only killed one of God's children as a human sacrifice. Toby Singer killed six million as a human guilt offering. Blemished rams he's offering, apparently, with Hitler apparently being a righteous servant because he got a portion, the hides of the Jewish people. I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm new to religion. Maybe that's acceptable ways to look at things or not think through what you're saying. I mean, who got the long line? I mean, there's, there's, you got to ask yourself questions. You can't just throw things out there. Not in my opinion. Not as Jews you can't. Now, maybe Christians do, and they do. But God expects a lot more from you folks, especially your teachers. Especially. But, of course, they've been dismissed. We'll see which one of them is going to repent and atone. The Jewish people are not described. It is a particular man known in the Babylon Talmud as the leper scholar, a man to be the representation of God in the day of the Lord, speaking and writing his words as the prophet like Moses. Yep, that's some interference out there, but I'm just now done. Um, thank you very much for listening.